Well, good evening. Thank you for joining me for um, the last of this uh, Bible study series that we've been doing on uh, Diana Butler Bass's book, um, Freeing Jesus. And, and again, I hope that this has been an interesting conversation for you. I've had a lot of fun uh, exploring some of the different ways that she presents for us to talk and think about who Jesus is and how we relate and connect to him and ways to get us out of um, you know, just some kind of closed in, boxed in sort of ways of talking about Jesus and uh, reminding us again that there's so much more to faith, uh, so much more than to the way that we talk about Jesus, the way that we talk about God, frankly, uh, and, and how that might open us up to some new ways of experiencing our own faith journeys in our own life. Uh, and and uh, I also think that, that this kind of conversation and conversations like this are really important tools uh, for the church, because I, I think we've had a rather closed off way of thinking and talking about uh, Jesus and God and all the aspects of faith, and, and I think in that process we've left people out of the conversation. And, and part of what I hope that uh, this series does, and part of what I loved about her book, uh, was that it maybe created some openings for people uh, to think in new ways of, about Jesus and about their faith. So. Um, with, with all, um, with great respect, and not at all to pretend that I'm uh, nearly as capable a theologian as uh, Dr. Butler Bass, uh, I wanted to suggest my own, uh, an, an idea of my own, uh, of a way for us to talk and think about Jesus too. Now, um, now these are the seminary words that we use to talk about Jesus as a prophet, a priest, a king. Uh, this is the language. Uh, these are the responses of the people of Jesus' day in the Gospels. This is the responses of the crowds. These are responses of the uh, of the scribes and the Pharisees as well, and they think about Jesus in this way. And as we go through the rest of the New Testament, we get into the uh, rest of the books of the New Testament, we see this this kind of language and these kind of Im images, and, and all are good. All are worthwhile and, and all have some value, uh, but they're very churchy kind of ways of thinking about things. And again, part of... of what, what really caught my attention in this book was to break out of, of just these sort of, these are the things you can say and these are the categories you can use uh, and to think of in different ways. So tonight I want to suggest that we talk about Jesus as a poet. Now, when we get to the end here, I'll talk to you about why I think that that's a valuable and important way. Uh, but first I just want to um, just kind of suggest what makes me think about Jesus as a poet when I read the Gospel. And when I read his words as well. So think with me for just a few moments about the Gospels and about the Jesus' words and his teachings and his discourses and his conversations with the disciples. I mean, we could start with, and I think that we probably would, start with Matthew and Luke, in part because they are so similar, uh, but in part because they are probably the, the great Gospels for discourse, right? I mean, Matthew and Luke contain uh, the Sermon on the Mount, or in Luke's case, the Sermon on the Plain, right? This great long discourse that has uh, as its beginning point the Beatitudes, right? And, and what a beautiful piece of poetry are, are the Beatitudes, right? The, the, these lines that all start, that they have this great uh, sort of rhythm to them. Uh, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, blessed are the meek, uh, you know, that, that, that have this just amazing kind of construction that comes off as poetry and and these powerful images that are much more than just words right i mean you, you can sort of picture jesus sitting there with this vast crowd and and as if he was reciting uh this poetry as if he was uh, making this great recitation and how how beautiful it would be uh not just cold teaching right not just analytical uh, doctrinal teaching, uh, but but this great sort of discourse uh, that sparks imagination. What does he mean when he says, "Blessed are the merciful," and it makes us then uh, your, your mind wanders thinking about acts of mercy and who are merciful and who needs mercy and and why is that a blessing and, and what does it mean to be blessed, right? I, I think and especially in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Then he goes on for all of these little pieces, these, these sort of pearls of wisdom. You know, you have heard it said of old, an eye for an eye, but I say unto you, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him also the left. Right? And, 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 and there's a rhythm then that proceeds 
through the to the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. And there are, are uh, several sort of teaching discourses in Matthew and in, in Luke that have just that that amazing sort of a sense of a well-constructed, uh, intentionally put together set of words uh, that has uh, clarity to be sure and purpose, uh, but is but also has a much higher rhetoric to it. It has a, a much higher kind of of, of feeling and, and rhythm and, and loveliness to it as well. Uh, and so then we might go to the Gospel of John, which is probably the most poetic of the Gospels in its own way. Uh, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very interested in the events of Jesus' life uh, and in his actions, in his miracles, uh, and so on, uh, John has very little of that, really only nine stories uh, encapsulate the whole of John's Gospel, but these long and, and kind of beautiful discourses. And then uh, John's Gospel ends with uh, the Last Supper uh, and, and these uh, great teachings and, and prayers that he shares with the disciples uh, over the 15th, 16th, 17th chapters. Um, and again, this this beautiful language um, that, that again, is both sort of simple uh, but very evocative. Um, I just wanted to read a little bit here from uh, from the last discourse, uh, Jesus talking here. He says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if, I, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you love one another. You know, what a lovely kind of constructed set of words there. It starts with this notion of, of the commandment of love, and it bookends it at the other end, and then it just builds, right? This is love to lay down one's life for one's friends. I call you friends now, not servants. Uh, I've made everything known to you. Now you didn't choose me. I chose you. Now I have appointed you to go out and to bear fruit. And then it circles itself right back around to this is the fruit that you will bear, that that you uh, that you honor my commandment to love one another. Right? This lovely poetry, not just uh, simple words or empty words, but uh, this very expressive sort of way of of, uh, of doing his sayings. I did just kind of want to make a quick comment about Mark. Uh, Mark, uh, as we know, is the first of the Gospels, the oldest of the Gospels. And for the longest time, it was believed that uh, Marx was probably the least literary of the Gospels. Uh, Mark has a way of just uh, going from moment to moment and scene to scene and event to event as it kind of rolls on through. But there are some discourses in Mark uh, that are, are very poetic. Uh, and I'm thinking in particular of the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, and I'm not going to read to you from, read from it to you, but uh, we'll invite you to spend a little time with. Um, and it's it's very classic uh, literature in that it's apocalyptic literature, and, and that it captures what is a sort of a standard form of literature of that day, and it's, it describes this this uh, horrific end and and when the Son of Man will return and all of these uh, very poetic signs and and symbols and figures and. And it captures in, in such a, a very frank and beautiful, almost violent way, you know, the, the coming struggles and catastrophes of the world. Um, and, and it's poetry. I mean, I, I don't think Jesus means for it. And I, I think when you read it, it becomes obvious that this is just information, right? But that he's caught it in, in such poetic language that he's gone to the length of, 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 of describing it uh, in these fantastic terms. Uh, th that that's the only way that you can hear it is as poetry uh, and not just as simple here's some ideas here's some information that you may need to know uh, as you go into the future as well so that kind of brings me to talk a little bit about the parables um, the parables of course are one of the primary ways that Jesus teaches in the Bible uh, the word parable actually appears uh, 48 times just in the synoptic gospels just in Matthew Mark and Luke there are between 40 and 60 parables in the Gospels, depending on how you count them. Uh, it it, it, it um, comprises uh, 
at least a third uh, of all of his teachings. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very common way, right, that he wants to, to answer things. And often the parables are posed as answers to questions. And instead of, so instead of getting a direct answer to a question when you ask Jesus, you get this little story, right? And, and you know how the parables work, right? They take a sort of a common, uh, something normal to life and society and to the earth. They take something that everybody can understand, and then he turns it into a metaphor, uh, or a symbol to use for comparison to illuminate some greater truth. And of course, what's fun about the parables is, for the most part, they really don't come with explanations, right? They're just these little riddles, uh, and in fact, often meant to be riddles. And Jesus occasionally will say that, that he speaks in parables uh, purposefully so that it won't be just easy to understand but so that people will be required not just to use their heads, but their hearts when they relate uh, to his words. Now, it was often the case that in the early church would try to turn that then into some easy sort of allegory, and that has often been the way that we've treated the parables. Well, we'll figure out what the symbol is. It's meant to be a secret hidden message, and we'll just solve it. And then the pastor will tell us what the parable means, and then we'll all know what it means, and we'll all agree that's what it means, and then we won't have to deal with it anymore. Except that's such a horrible thing to do to the parables. I think that he means for the parables to have a certain sense of mystery and some room for imagination. I mean, they are these little pictures, these little word pictures that he paints that that you can see new and different things in every time you read them. That's what makes them effective. Not that they have one simple, clear meaning, but that in fact, wherever you are, at whatever stage of life that you're at, you can find something in the parable that you can connect to, and, and in doing so, you can discover something uh, true and, and great of, about the faith. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's wonderful about the parables is they usually have a very shocking punchline at the end. I think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, a common parable that we all kind of know. But the idea that a Samaritan, who would be considered an enemy of the Judeans, an enemy of the Jews, would be the hero of this story, the one person to show compassion on this poor man who had been beaten and left to die. That's a pretty shocking punchline to the hearers of Jesus' day. And so, you know, for us to to hear that story, uh, we need to work a little harder probably to really capture its power. Uh, the other one, of course, a, a really well-known parable uh, that we all know is the parable of the prodigal son. Right? And, and this idea that this father would welcome home this wayward son who had taken half his money and half his estate and just destroyed it for nothing and that the father would welcome him with open arms and, and a great celebration is a surprise and shocking ending to the story. And, and one that we can't just dismiss, but one that, that invites us then to really wrestle with and question the nature of compassion and and grace, and to open up, again, not just our heads, but our hearts, to think differently about um, the grace of God as well. Um, that was kind of a common way of Jesus' teaching, was using these parables, again, to, to invoke and to provoke people to, to thinking about what he was saying, and not just, uh, you know, he, there's a place in the Gospels where it talks about Jesus' authority as a teacher. And it compares him directly to the scribes, who are the great teachers of Jesus' day, of the time of the, of the Bible. And, and of course, the scribes are, are also lawyers. Sometimes that's how we interpret that word. And the scribes teach as lawyers. That is, they teach uh, technical information. This is what this verse of the law means. This is how it should be used. Uh, this is what it allows and what it does not. And, and that would be a common way of relating to uh, the Torah of that day. And that actually was a common rabbinical technique as well, uh, to, to deal with the words as they are given and, and to, to debate about what, go back and forth about what they meant and how they were to be used, right? But, but Jesus instead uh, gives us all of this, this discourse that is far beyond simple, uh, that is lovely and beautiful like poetry, uh, but as always finally uh, requires an interpretation, right? It requires a, a feeling. Uh, part of what's beautiful about poetry, and I think it's true of all of the Bible, the prophets, 
uh, lots of poetry in the prophets and in the Psalms, of course, right? It is, it's that there is an emotional content uh, as well as a, a logical and reasonable content. And that, that emotional content is every bit as important. It's not just enough uh, to be able to describe in technical terms how Jesus is the Son of God or how he fits the model of who the Messiah is. The question always is, you know, the question that Jesus brings back to Peter uh, in his appearance after the resurrection, Peter, do you love me? And it's not, Peter, do you understand me? It's not, Peter, do you know me? It's not, Peter, can you recite verses uh, from the Hebrew Bible that, that connect to me? Peter, can you capture me in doctrine? The question is, Peter, do you love me? And, and that's why, in the end, I like this idea of thinking about Jesus as a poet. Because that's what poets do. right? They, they take experience, they take words to the level of experience. They take thoughts and ideas and express them in ways uh, beyond just the words as they appear on, on the paper and on the page. Right? And you, poets are the ones who can tell us what love is. And love is certainly not something that can be captured in words. Right? But the, the truth of what love is requires poetry. The, the truth of life, uh, of what it means to feel sad, what it means to be hurt, what it means to be angry, right? All of those deep and very human experiences require poetry. And, and surely faith is about those things. If faith is only a matter of intellect, if faith is only a question of doctrine and what the church has said uh, over the years that, that doctrine must be, then it is a very small thing. And, and maybe that's why for many of us, faith does not occupy our entire life. Because we treat it academically, because we keep it captured uh, just in, in some simple words, it, it doesn't spill over into our whole life. But if we experience Jesus as a poet, as one who speaks the language of our heart, a language that is beyond what we can capture uh, intellectually or academically, then it becomes a part of everything. Because we are nothing if we are not creatures of feeling, of emotion. Uh, of, of love and, and that of course is, is really why poets matter the most poets teach us to think about love to feel about love to express and experience love and if that's not what Jesus is for then well, I'm not really frankly sure what, what it's all about anyway anyhow those are my thoughts about it as we kind of wrap up this series something I wanted to leave you with uh, as well. I think there are probably more, probably lots of more ways for us to talk and think about who Jesus is and how we experience him. And so I would really just invite you to reflect for yourself on, on who you find Jesus to be and how would you describe him uh, and in hopes that that might give you, one, a, a tool with better to explore your own journey of faith and then perhaps also uh, an opportunity for you to engage in conversation with others in brand new ways that might invite them also into a new relationship with Jesus. So I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this series. Again, the book is called Freeing Jesus. It's by Diana Butler Bass. It's available in all the places that books are available. I think it's a terrific read, very accessible. I, I think you would enjoy it very much uh, to read it as well. Uh, we'll be back uh, um, next week, I hope. Uh, with a, a new study as well. Again, and we're going to continue to do this uh, online series at 6 o'clock on Wednesdays. In the meantime, you take good care, uh, and we'll hope to see you again soon.